you speak of a pandemic, but we also speak of violence amongst all these, uh, uh, this violent phenomenon. And the first thing would be the numbers of violence, which in a way, happily now to a lesser degree, we were accustomed to an account uh, at all of dead people. Uh, I speak of the uh, pandemic uh, toll, yes, but along with the great toll, daily toll, and the journal of uh, uh, people dying of COVID, we have witnessed that for two years. Antonio Damaso, the renowned uh, neurologist, would say that this experience, he would call it an emotional bookmark. Therefore, an emotional bookmark, as it has an expression, that leaves such a, a very <clears throat> deep uh, engraving in ourselves that really shakes out tectonic plaques, both as cultures, uh, societies, and persons. So I would like to mention the three major impacts and the ensuing violence that they may generate. Number one is the fact that people become more myopic. Therefore, they see no future ahead because there are these successive uh, sources uh, of fear the energy crisis, the war, the inflation, and therefore they have no perspective ahead. They can, have, they can no longer have a long-term perspective. This is the first thing. The second is because it leads to people being more uh, conservative. And this will see people being here and working in so important companies already witnessed that is that we leave the post-war feet uh, culture, that is the American dream moving ahead, the social ascending, they, move, they leave that. We have entered the so-called, uh, it's not worth it. It's not worth trying. It's not worth wasting myself for the company, whatever. That is quiet quitting, the great resignation, as we all know it. The great resignation that we all know, that we have started witnessing in the Western countries. These are the impact. After that, we usually uh, deal with uh, the victims. If we go back, speaking of the person, of the individual, that takes a life, causes uh, uh, damage or loss uh, or hurt to someone else. How could we all, uh, handle this as a society so as to alleviate that? Well, to be honest, I, I'm fascinated by this question. Well, I can, in, uh, I can include it in my resume, says uh, the moderator. Yes, that's true, because no one is involved with that. How we could support uh, and prevent the action of the um, instigator, the perpetrator? Usually there are two kinds of violence. One of it is uh, uh, physical abuse, physical violence that we see on TV, but the other one is psychological, psychological uh, uh, violence, which we see in the traumas caused on children. And quite often, this is uh, triggered by women. Let us not take them away from the equation. So where is this to be attributed? That is family violence, women getting killed, or... Um, gender violence, what causes, what creates uh, a perpetrator? I would suggest that actually this violence starts from the moment that a person does not know how, cannot tolerate, or does not manage to handle, alleviate uh, one's violent sentiment, sentiments, the anger, the agony, the fear, the complex of inferiority, the feeling of insecurity, whatever, you name it, in this bucket of violent emotions. The point is, why can't we handle and manage those emotions appropriately? I will give you the explanation. 
there's a solution there because communication has been digitalized. We all speak uh, on our group chats on Vib. The second is the following. When I keep adding uh, violent emotions, we have a digital assistant that I can push all the problems under the carpet. I can spend another uh, couple of uh, of minutes with TikTok, and therefore I push my negative emotion under the rug. But when the rug is overflown, then there will be an explosion. It may not be perceived and seen on the TV screen, but it can come through and cause suffering at the very vulnerable and um, sensitive soul over uh, a young child. Many of us are parents here. We have friends. We have caring persons. The point is, how can we not be perpetrators? So what I suggest is digital diet and real connection with our emotions, open our hearts to our different difficult emotions, share them and be able to alleviate what we go and air them, give air to that. You spoke of this digital uh, diet, but on the other hand, we have this digital bulimia that sends us to the social media. And instead of pushing those negative emotions under the rug, you spill over all these uh, negative emotions on social media. We have all those haters on uh, fa Facebook, uh, Instagram, you name it. Of course, that's true. And uh, airing uh, this violence, but venting this um, violence, but this is only a temporary relief, not substantially, so as to build uh, yourself better. So, now, vis-a-vis -vis the new violence profile, how would you characterize it? How would you view it? Because we see violence going down the Down the road, we see a multiplication of those violent phenomena and coming lower to the pyramid. <laughs> Indeed, the violence uh, goes lower because low, and the lower strata, we find people who believe that they have no other options. I believe that in our Greek society as well, there is now the way out to young persons who are unemployed, who do not identify to any established system. They enter small gangs or unemployed youth who see no other way out than being integrated in such small neighbor gangs, neighborhood gangs or consider that they are entitled to a crime since the time of the paternalistic state has uh, gone by. Now, speaking of this violence, there's also another kind, a new type of violence, which is the digital violence that finds you anywhere in the office. Don't have to go down to the sidewalk. It finds you in the office, at home, new forms uh, of fraud, new ways uh, that uh, can people can uh, uh, usurpate, can take away our property, whatever. How do we do with that? Oh, you say it's so nice. Yes, it's the invisible enemy. Okay, let's change seats. Okay, no, no, you are uh, very precise in describing this invisible enemy. I would suggest that the reason, the cause for all that starts from the plethora of information, the avalanche of information, and that we have been uh, utterly digitalized. Not the last two years, but it, the whole uh, venture was completed in the last two years. That means that we do not have in our brain open uh, critical minds so as to process the information. When we have this avalanche of information that comes from many social networks, the internet, media, whatever, what means we gulp down this uh, piece of information without having really assimilated. And then one starts imperceptibly losing the old, very valuable old skill called the critical mind. What does this mean? A critical mind means that I 
cross-examine. First, uh, I put a break on this uh, avalanche of information, of this uh, attention deficit disorder that we all have now. We have 300 screens and windows at the same time, and we shift from one screen to the other without really focusing. So we must put a break so as not only to focus, but to impose on ourselves to cross-check. When we think of our next click, at that point, we start protecting ourselves from the invis invisible digital enemy. Because the invisible digital enemy is based on our impulsive uh, new click. So once uh, we start uh, cross-checking and thinking, we have already protected ourselves. We have put ourselves in the self-protecting mode, I would say. Yes, that's very good. Yes, because as we know, multitasking is excellent. Most of us uh, exercise that, or we should exercise it in order to have some kind of career. But the point is that within this multitasking, one can get lost and uh, not the well thought of a clicker can cost dearly. Yes, and we are very responsible on that matter. Now, regarding those cases where we have victims, people that uh, are victims, those cases come uh, in the spotlight. We may be interested for a couple of days uh, on this uh, affair, but those that should have been interested vis-a-vis -vis both the prevention and the investigating and uh, uh, persecuting such cases are not really interested, and I mean that, the competent authorities. We've seen that in all aspects of violence, uh, home violence, uh, youth violence, and so forth. Well, I'll say the following. What we mostly experienced over the last two years, starting from the immediate uh, digitalization and the expanse of social uh, networks, the following. The perpetrator has more than ever access to a public, has a public say. So if uh, the perpetrator knows how to create a narration, support it, and uh, promote it to the appropriate networks and specialists, then the perpetrator can present himself as a, a victim. And we've seen that. This we see, we've seen it on multiple occasions. So we have an alternation of roles, yes, precisely. This I will call social gaslighting. That is the, the, the possibility, if you have a very clever narration, to put uh, on the spotlight your victim as a perpetrator. We can say a lot about uh, the unleveraged justice, but this is not the subject of our discussion here. I consider that this is a personal responsibility of each and everyone to manage to have uh, individual and independent thought and action, both of these, because then one can build the internal resistance vis-a-vis -vis the social gaslighting and the perpetrator present himself as a victim. This uh, an individual, independent thought and action. We must think uh, how we will teach it our children, how it will be taught in school within the spectrum of soft skills, which is necessary so as to have effective and useful people in society. Most important. Before concluding, we have another five minutes. Let us move to something more generic. We have been discussing uh, about the subsequent and successive crises. It's like a babushka doll, I would, pre I would uh, describe it, because one crisis has another within it. But if we move back behind from 2010 and before that, we used to have a society, Greek society, which for good or better, 
that was in the face of the so-called lobster spaghetti we used to characterize it in Greece. Therefore, of a kind of uh, affluence, affluent prosperity. Things have long gone. The point is whether all that have reduced the narcissism of the average Greek, that everything is to cast for, last forever, Porsche Cayenne for everyone, and uh, building up debt uh, on the credit cards. Well, let me tell you something about the narcissistic character of the average Greek. We are a very particular case. We are this civilization that passes 12 years in the primary and secondary education learning about ancient uh, antiquity and mythology. Originally, we are the heroes, the, the gods. Then we go to antiquity, then to the Byzantine, and then we end at the end of the 12th year, year that we are the most insignificant country of a nation of the world. And this is reiterated every three years. That is, for 12 years, we've been taught systematically that we have been the most grandiose nation of the world. And we are taught how we, um, how our grandeur has been taken away from us. This is the reality for us who have been through this 12-year cycle of education in Greece. So what is our narcissism? I don't believe that we have a narcissist before beyond the hedonism. I consider that what we really lack is contemporary Greek identity. Who are we? as contemporary Greeks. What is our consist consistent element? What uh, makes us a nation? What is our identity, our feeling of belonging? What, belo what relates us and connects us in our overall societal narration as an identity? So if I lose my identity because I lost my job, I got a divorce because uh, I have the empty nest syndrome my child has left, what is my identity, my Greek identity that can bring me back? to and reconnect me to the deep-rooted uh, values and principles. I must remind you that we have started as Alexander the Great, and we are taught how we concluded being uh, the, um, the Karagios. So we must uh, find our next paradigms, the next models. This is a job that each and everyone does. Precisely the creation of those uh, paradigms, these uh, role models, where could it stem from? I think that it can stem from people such as you and all of us here in this uh, hall who assume their personal responsibility as a personal responsibility uh, of being leaders. The people that will parade from this podium, the next speaker, Mr. Tassis, who has said wonderful things and has a very uh, effective uh, uh, place in the academia. These are modern contemporary Greeks, such as you, Mr. Tassis, the next speakers, and those who have preceded, and we've already had Mr. Bakatselos, Mr. Spirtunias, Mr. Schinas. These are the Greeks, the shiny Greeks, if you allow the expression, who, even if we've got this caption that they write something, actually they have it on their front, the virtue. The virtue, this is a long forgotten word. The integrity of our nation, the sacrifice and generosity and being good, these are virtues. Some people have a front writing precisely all those principles and values, and this we will perceive and we will assimilate through the osmosis, as long as we take it personally. Personally, most of us. And before concluding in political leadership, what could political leadership do? What could a new generation of politicians do? I don't like to put it on age graphs, if you like, because there are also young people who are already old and older people who may be indeed uh, agencies of innovation. Well. I would be very heretic in my answer. I would say, therefore, that today, when people have been through two years of terror and see an additional terror coming along, coming along of war, inflation, and so forth, they vote and select 
bulldog uh, politicians, warriors, that is. Politicians who are Hulk and Hogan for those who follow the Marvel heroes. They want people that can bite. They want angry people and abhor the political um, sissy. Pansy. This kind of length of helplessness. They they feel helpless and they want a Rottweil as politician. Find Rottweil politicians. And this will take us back to the medieval ages. I'm so sorry. The young generation of politicians, however, the new generation of politicians might per perhaps create and coin a new leadership model, but I don't believe that they would do it. Why? Because behind them in the political scenes, they are the political Procrustean characters that we will cut them around so as to have them fit in the specific standards. If some politicians have the nerve and the resistance to remain, to remain outside the wooden uh, molds of politics will not be wasted. We do have these shiny exceptions, bright exceptions. I do have a couple of persons in mind who have really already changed our life. One example is our digital transformation of the public sector. I believe that this, we can make a great prayer for such uh, people to come along in the politics. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy this session. God bless you. We really thank you. Thank you.